do it. All right. I like that. Real estate contracts, ready? Ready. What is a contract? An agreement. An agreement. Okay. So when we talk about real estate contracts, we're talking about the seller and the buyer agreeing to a sale and a purchase, right? So before that agreement happens, the buyer has to present an offer, okay? In the state of New Jersey, most states is similar, the offer is called real estate contract, okay? So I want you, where it says real estate contract, I want you to write offer. We're going to address that later on again, but I want you to know, real estate contract is an offer. I heard somebody said offer, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So you took three days off that you were studying. Mm -hmm. Say yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Contract law. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Contract law. First of all, I want you to highlight. What? <laughs> I want you to highlight where it says a contract may be defined as a voluntary agreement between legally competent parties to perform or refrain from performing some legal act supported by legal consideration. So what we're saying is every contract must be out of our own free will. So both parties agree not because they're being forced but because they want to. Because my offer is my free will, and your acceptance is your free will. You got it? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the basics of contracts. Next page, it says essential elements of a valid contract. There's four essential elements that must be with every single contract, and you guys must remember this. Number one is competent parties. Competent parties means that to enter into a binding contract in New Jersey, a person must be at least 18 years old and of sound mind. 18 years old and of sound mind. Meaning you're conscious about what you're doing. Fashion. Being 18 years old means that you're a legal adult. If you want to write somewhere there, legal adult. <laughs> Guys, legal adult. Write that somewhere there. Now pay attention to this because we have two sentences here that are completely, they're similar, but actually they're completely different. They're similar in the way they're written, but they're completely different. It says, a married person under 18 is considered an adult. A How can you get married if you're under 18? Parents consent. Parents consent, and that's called? Oh, I thought that was like, oh, I'm So they're saying, yeah, get the hell out, go get married, don't come back. Right? Yes. You're responsible for everything from, from now on. So from the age of 16 and on, you can be emancipated and allowed to absorb contracts and liabilities. You get hit with it. Yeah, before that, the, no law allows you to get married. In Jersey. 16. Can be married with 16? Yeah. If your parents sign. Yeah, there was a celebrity that did that. My mom was 15 when she got married. I don't know how. Yeah, okay, but she was in Portugal. Yeah, that was, was, that was not, a, not an age. She put yes, yeah, the age of sign. Oh, in Portugal's okay? <laughs> 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 but I'm glad that she married that age because she's 18 years old. No, that's not the celebrity. Yeah. 18 years old. Yeah. Yeah. That played on baby. You're a legal adult. What? Yeah. Okay. He's old, married 16 years old. Parents were okay with it. I still don't believe in Cultures. Come on, cultures. That's it. So, did you guys understand? If yeah. you're married under 18, you are a legal adult. If you're married and you're under 18, you're a legal adult. And this is totally different than the next sentence. That's why I wanted to make sure you understood this. Because the next sentence says, persons under 18 may enter into a contract, but the contract is voidable by the minor until a reasonable time after he or she reaches the age of 18. So, in one says, you're a legal adult, therefore, deal with it. The other one says, once you become of age, you can cancel or avoid the contract. The difference is the marriage. 
If the question does not state that that person is married under 18, mm -hmm. then that person, once they reach the age of 18, they're now a sound mind, they became a legal adult by law, and they can void the contract saying, hey, I did not understand this before. And I'll give you an example. My son and I, my oldest son and I, we have property together. He's 12. Can he reach the age of 18 and say, real estate, I don't care about real estate. I could only does is play video games apparently. Okay. <laughs> but you care about real estate because you're here. Yes. He's actually reading two books about real estate investing, so I'm happy. I'm only reading one. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> but can you get into a property right now? Right? We're gonna buy a property together, me and you. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See that's the joke. Right? But once you reach the age of eighteen, yeah. so on the seventeenth. Yeah. Can you cancel that contract? Yes. Yes, you can, because when you entered into the contract, you were a minor. 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 What if you were married? Could you? Yes. No. No. Because you're a legal adult. That's the difference between these two sentences right here. If you were married at the, under 18 at the time that you signed the agreement with me, it's not voidable when I turned 18. Right, because right. you were already considered an adult. Right. You guys got it? Yes. Yeah. All I needed to add was one word legal yeah. person. That would have changed everything, I know. Yes. You guys got it? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so um, if you're married under 18, so between the age of 16 to 18, you could get married if you have parents' consent. The moment you got married, you became a legal adult. So you're treated as if you were 18 already. Even if you commit a crime, guess what? You're now 18. Deal with it. Okay? So if you get into a contract right now, you're 17, married. Right now, you get into a contract, it's legally binding. There's nothing you can do about it. If you try to back out of the contract, there's consequences. Okay. Just like this, 18. Just like this if you were 18. Or if you're a minor, so you're under 18, but doesn't mention at all that you're married, or gives you any hint of being married in the question, then you're a minor. Once you reach the age of 18, you're now a legal adult. Now you're supposed to understand what life is at the age of 18. You read that contract and you go like, I don't understand anything like that, that, that's written here. I don't even know how I was able to sign this. Therefore, I'm voiding this contract. I don't want to deal with it. There's no consequences because you were a minor at the time, a single minor at the time that you signed. Yeah, yeah? I think the... Um Confusion is the very first thing that says you must be at least 18. And then they contradict themselves and says that a single person under 18 may enter that valid contract. So you must be 18 to be binding. Okay. That's what it says, to be binding. Okay. It doesn't say you cannot enter into a contract, it just says to be binding. Oh. Okay. Which also means that it's a reasonable time after you reach 18. If you're now 19 years old and you're trying to dispute something, now you might have a problem. Right. If you're 20 years old and say, hey, I just found out that I was a minor back then. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> you guys got it? Yeah. All right. We got you. So that's competent parties. Next. Offer an acceptance. This is the second one. Offer an acceptance. If I offer and you accept, he becomes... A contract. Mm -hmm. If I offer, you don't accept, it becomes nothing. You got it? Mm -hmm. Offer and acceptance. This requirement is called mutual assent. It means that there must be a meeting of the minds on each term of the contract, and the wording of the contract must express all agreed on terms and must be clearly understood by the parties. This is my offer. All details. Do you accept? The moment you accepted, you understood all the details. If I try to impose something that's not in the contract, is it legally binding? No, only the terms that were described in the contract. Okay? Mm -hmm. Number three, consideration. There must be, a degree must be based on good or valuable consideration. Consideration, please underline this, is what the parties promise in the agreement to give to or receive from each other. Consideration may consist of legal tender, exchange of value, or love and affection. 
The price or amount must be definitely stated and payable in exchange for the deed or right to receive. In a sales contract, please highlight, underline, put a star. In a sales contract, that means there was an actual sale, the consideration is the entire purchase price. If it was a gift, different story. But if it's a sale, that's why you guys need to understand what the question says. If it's a sale, it must be the actual entire purchase price. You sold for 500,000, contract must state 500,000. Yeah. Okay? Good? Yeah. Number four, legality of the object. To be valid and enforceable, a contract must not involve a purpose that is illegal or against public policy. So I'm going to offer you a million dollars right now to sell Coke. Is that legal? No. no. What? Why not? Coca-Cola. Yes, of course. Oh. Why would it be anything else? Oh, it's a Coke. What were you guys thinking? What? <laughs> Coca-Cola. <laughs> no? <laughs> yes. What were you thinking? No. Mm -hmm. You just said Coke. Right now. He's a minor, so you can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> but he's married. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know if he turned red because of the married part or because of the whole part. All of it. All of it. All of it. It wasn't me, right? So, if the contract is for Coca Cola, no problems. It's binding. If the contract was for the other type of Coke, it's illegal. It's not enforceable. It's not binding. Got it? If it's an illegal purpose, it's not binding at all. So four elements must be with every single contract. Competent parties, offer and acceptance, consideration, and legal purpose. You got it? Yes. You must know these four. It says a valid contract may be oral or written. Parole evidence rule, however, states that a written contract takes precedence over all agreements or uh, promises. Remember I just said, maybe it was a long time ago, I said I was going to give you a million dollars to sell coke? Yeah. You remember that? That's up to you. I just wrote code. Uh, but here's the thing. That was a verbal agreement. If you guys are highlighting, not paying attention. Let's stay right here. It was a verbal agreement that I made with you. Correct? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to put it in writing. And because you're all excited, you saw how quick you said yes? Yeah. You're all excited that you're getting a million dollars. In the contract, you did not notice that there's a bunch of zeros, but one is missing. <laughs> and you signed. <laughs> Guess what you signed for? 100,000. 100, Can you fight it? No. Probably not. I'll address that in a second. But written contracts take precedence over oral agreements. That means that what's in writing is stronger than what we spoke. Yeah. Good? All right. Now, there's a statute of frauds. And there's exceptions. So statute of fraud says, New Jersey statute of fraud states that a contract for sale of real estate and any lease more than three years must be in writing and signed in order to be enforceable. Underline must be in writing and signed in order to be enforceable. And look what it says next. There's an exception. In 1996, the New Jersey statute of frauds was changed so that it also allows oral contracts to be enforced where there is clear and convincing evidence that the buyer and seller had agreed orally on exact real estate to be transferred. The nature of the interest to be transferred, go to the right hand side on top, and the existence of the agreement and of course the identity of the transferee. So, as long as we got proof, clear and convincing evidence that I said a million dollars, right? then you can overturn what we wrote. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Clear and convincing evidence. You have proof. You are distracted when you sign, but you have proof that, uh, that my intention was to give you a million dollars. You got it? Recording's not always allowed. Certain states, two-party agreements, some states, one-party agreement. We went over this yeah. in the previous chapter, right? So you gotta be careful of what you record. Most of the times you have to have consent. Like in New Jersey, for instance, if there's cameras, it should say, hey, you're being watched or you're being recorded. If there's audio, it must definitely state that there's audio as well. Okay? You guys got it? Yes. Yeah. Okay.
And just so you know, that was my disclosure to you, and you guys agree with it. We are in No, but you see how it works in Jersey? One party. Oh. I said it. You guys did not complain about it. You're not being recorded. But I'm just I'm just giving you the example. Right. But you are not being recorded. The the audio, but not visual. So what I'm saying is when we put a sign and nobody complains about it, you still go in and stay in the place, you're giving consent to be recorded. Right. You guys got it? Yeah. If I say over the phone uh, that, that it's being recorded and you don't say anything, then consent. Right, because you're not disputing it. Correct. Very much. Okay. All right. Yeah. You already know this. The real estate broker's authorization must be in writing and signed for either sale or lease transaction, whether the broker is acting on behalf of the seller, buyer, landlord, or tenant. Then we have types of contracts. So we have express or implied, unilateral or bilateral, executory or executed, and we have valid and enforceable, voidable or void. Express or implied contracts, as you guys highlight, is very easy. Did everybody sign an agreement or each sign an agreement to come to the class? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That document expressed what we are providing to you and what you must do, it's expressed. So it's all the details there. It could have been verbally expressed. In this case, it's in writing. So express could be oral or verbal in, um, details of the contract. You signed or he signed, so you agree to the terms. Implied is what we expect to happen. So it's expressed that you have to do 75 hours. It is expressed that you have to take an exam. It is expressed that you have one year after that to take a state exam, and you have to apply for your license right after that. Does that make sense? Expressed. What is implied? It's implied that for you to pass, you should be studying. It is implied that for you to pass, you should be here in every class. It is implied that you're paying attention. It is implied that you're not on yourself. I'm sorry, it's expressed. You shouldn't be on yourself. I'm sorry. Retract that. It is implied, pretty much, that there's something that must be done on your end in order for this agreement to work. Does that make sense? If you don't put in that effort that I just spoke about, then we're not liable. You see the difference between expressed and implied? Mm -hmm. Questions on this? <clears throat> Questions on this? Charging. Not needed. Next, we have bilateral and unilateral contracts. Highlight these as, as a stand. So, bilateral and unilateral. Lateral means side. So if we have a unilateral contract, it means one-sided agreement. Bilateral contract, two-sided agreement. What's the difference between these? Well, if it's a one-sided agreement, only one party must comply before the other one takes action. So you got to do this, and if you do it, then I'll do that. A bilateral agreement is you're doing something and I'm doing something in order to meet the common goal. So we got to both perform. Does that make sense? Okay. So a real estate sales contract says right here is a bilateral contract because a seller agrees to sell, the buyer agrees to buy, and both of them take positive steps towards the act. Good? Unilateral agreement. It says right here, an offer, right at the bottom, an offer of a reward is an example of unilateral contract because under this agreement, a law enforcement agency, go to the next page, offers a monetary payment to anyone who can aid in the capture of the criminal. It says, hey, if you give me info and we capture the criminal, I'll reward you. Are you going to call the cops and say, hey, I'm about to witness a crime. Where's my money? Does that make sense? Witness the crime, provide the information, and then we'll reward you. So unilateral, if you do this, then I'll do that. Okay. Then we have executed and executory contracts. Let's go to medieval times. What does it mean to be executed? Killed. Just killed. Chopped off. <laughs> killed. Oh, Done with. Okay. Right? Finalized. Finalized. There you go. Done. You're done. You're finished. So an executed contract is a contract that is completed. When do we complete the contract? Closing, for instance. Does that make sense? Or, or the listing expired. We're done. Okay? 
Executory means something is pending until it's executed. So for instance, as you guys highlight, I put an offer on the, on the contract, the seller agrees to that offer, we start the executory portion. There's stuff pending as we go. And we get to the closing table and it's now closed. Being closed means executed. So during that period of time from offer till closing, that contract was executory. We got to the end, done, finished, closed, executed. You got it? Questions? There's another meaning to this. If I sign the contract but you don't, is this contract valid? No. No. So in order to be fully executed, that's what it's called here in the bottom, to be fully executed, all parties must sign. So executed could also mean everybody signed. So the contract in itself is closed. And it becomes executory for the terms that remain until we actually, we actually have the um, transfer of title. Mm -hmm. Good? Yeah. Questions? No. Um, awesome. The bilateral and unilateral contract. What about that? Um, highlighted in green? No. Yellow? No. Okay. I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. no, no. All right, uh, validity of contracts. Highlight exactly as it is here. A valid contract contains all essential elements. What does that mean? Essential elements, what does that mean? What are the essential elements? Okay, which are? Both parties being there. Both parties being there. Look to the left, competent parties. To the left of the book. Offer and acceptance, consideration, and legal purpose or legality of the object. So Raphael, you're right. The most important things must be there, which is legal adults, sound mind, offer, acceptance, exchange of value, and be for legal purpose. If these four are part of the, the agreement, then it's a valid contract. Does it say signature anywhere? No. So do we need a signature in order to be valid? No. No, because it could be a verbal agreement. And I'm saying this because you will fail one of the answers because you're going to assume, and this is the next chapter, but I'm telling you right now, you're going to assume that signature is a requirement. Okay? There's going to be a question, and you're going to go for a signature. Most of you, that's what usually happens. Can you fix the question? No. No. <laughs> next, we have void contract. What does it mean to be void? Well, if a valid contract has four elements, the four essential elements, a void contract is missing one of them at least. Yeah. Which is legal adult. Legal adult. It could be the offer or acceptance. It could be lack of consideration or exchange of value. It could be also illegal. So any of those four missing. As long as one is missing, contract is void. Okay? What did you say before prior to that? I have no idea. You said something about a I was just saying, is a signature an essential element? No. And there's going to be a question in the next chapter in leases, there's going to be a question that addresses signature. But once you read the question, it says verbal contract. Therefore, signature is not a requirement. So you got to read. If it's in writing, then signature might be something required in leases. If it's a verbal, do we need to sign somewhere if it's a verbal agreement? In the lease. That's it. So you got to pay attention to the question. That's what I've been saying from the beginning, right? Yeah. Good. Voidable contract. You should know this already. We went over this example. What is a voidable contract? Minor. Because of age, could void the contract. Remember that? Yeah. It is valid because if, if you don't uh, cancel the contract, it's enforceable. But if you reach the age of 18 and say, hey, you know, I'm not going to do this, it's okay. It's voidable. Then we have unenforceable contract. An unenforceable contract also seems on the surface to be valid. However, neither party can successfully sue the other to force performance. Please highlight. Put 
with stars. An unenforceable contract is said to be valid between the parties because if both desire to go through with it, they can do so. So what does he write that example about when Uh, so no, because the, the terms of the, uh, the the contract were already written before. Just you got to a point where they're bickering at each other because of that. In this case, an example here, we're going to read this example, is Jason may have been drunk when he agreed to buy uh, Robert's property. Was Jason in sound mind? No. So can I enforce the contract? No. No. But what if the next day when he sobers up says, I really want this? Can we move forward? Yes. Yes. So the example here is if one party is not of sound mind or other the rest or something like that, but then a few days later it says, we're good to go, then it's enforceable. If they say, no, 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 let's back out of this, it's unenforceable because you are not of sound mind. Okay? On the right hand side on top. It says undue influence and undue influence and duress. What I just told you right now. It says contract signed by a person under duress, meaning forced, or undue influence, meaning being taken advantage of, are voidable and may be canceled by that person or court. Extreme care. Underline this because you guys, it's not for a state exam, but it's for you guys. Extreme care should be taken when one or more of the parties to a contract is elderly, sick in great distress or under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Remember we started this chapter with this. To be valid, please highlight in their line for stars, bubbles, whatever you gotta put. To be valid, every contract must be signed as a free and voluntary act of each party. Okay. If I'm under the influence, it's not a voluntary act, I'm, in, I'm impaired, right? So I cannot be conscious in what I'm doing, you're taking advantage of me. Like what? Yeah. Okay. Let's skip that. <laughs> Performance of contract. It says occasionally a contract may call for a specific time at or by which the, the agreed on acts must be completely performed. So most contracts have a clause. For instance, the closing date. That closing date is 90 days from now on. August 15th, I'm just throwing a number out there, it's exact, right? So 90 days from now, we reach the week before, so August 7th, for instance, and the seller still did not get the CO, Certificate of Occupancy. Has anybody ever applied for a CO? Ms. Jones, you know how long it takes to get a CO? Yeah, a couple of weeks. Couple of weeks. We're a week away from the promised close, closing date. Do you think we're going to get the CO before we close? No, no. So do you think we're closing? No, no. No. So what my attorney will do is send a letter to your attorney saying, time is of the essence. Please all right. Time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. Meaning, hurry up. We agreed to close on the 15th. We're a week away and you still don't have everything needed? Hurry up because time is of the essence. I need to close by and now we give you a new date. Most of the times they give you a new date and if by that date, so the letter will say, if by that date we still don't have everything lined up, we're backing out free of any obligation. Meaning you can't sue me because you're the one that screwed up. Does that make sense? So time is of the essence, right there. Next we have assignment and novation. So assignment refers to a transfer of rights and or duties under a contract. Most of you nowadays might know this as wholesaling. Have you ever heard of wholesaling before? Yeah. Okay. That's what it is. I put it under contract and then I transfer those rights to purchase to somebody else. But it does, it's not always necessary to have a wholesaling meaning you're going to get paid from it. It might just be a transfer because you guys remember Jason and Robert. Jason was drunk and Robert signed the contract with Jason. Mm -hmm. But a few days later, fully sober, Jason goes 
Hey, Robert. Uh, yeah, things got tough. I'm not able to buy the property. If it's a few days later and the contract was not canceled, isn't it enforceable? Because a few days later, you're sober. So now you're a competent party. There was an offer and acceptance while you were drunk, but now you're a competent party. There's consideration, which is the house and the money you have to put, and it's a legal purpose. So if these four essential elements are there, as of now, can you back out? No. Is it no. Oh. No, you can't. It's been it's beyond the, all the reviews. It's binding. Okay? okay. I'm going to say attorney review has done all that stuff. It's binding. You cannot back out anymore. Mm -hmm. The assignment allows Jason to back out by transferring their liability to somebody else. So let's say Jason gets Ali to buy. So you sit back there, I'm still gonna pick up. So Jason goes like, hey, Ali, here's the thing. I saw this property, I was a little drunk. It happens to be a good deal, so that's why I stuck with it. But now I realize that I can't afford it. There's something happened in my life and I can't afford it. Are you interested? And if Ali looks at the contract and goes like, huh, this is a good deal. I'll do it. Then Jason assigns or transfers the contract to Ali. Who's who has to now buy the house? Ali. But the question is, what if she doesn't? Who's liable? Jason. Both of us. See, it says right here, in case of assignment, a DSI nor, which is Jason, right, maintains secondary liability if the assignee Ali, right, breaches the contract. So if she does not buy, both of us are liable. Okay, and that's the problem. I'll tell you right now why I don't like these uh, three-day courses that people go to. Because in three days, they're jamming so much information. You hear wholesaling, hey, it's simple. Put a contract, transfer. And people get out of there, they feel like they're Superman or Superwoman, right? They're like, yeah, I can do this. I got this. I put it on the contract, I'm transferring. Yeah, there's a few details missing. See, if Allie needs a mortgage, I'm now at risk in transferring to Allie because she might not qualify for that mortgage. So if the deal is most likely going to fall through. So if you ever get involved in these three-day courses and all that stuff, it's okay. But I'm just letting you know, find cash buyers. Reduce that liability of coming back to you. Does that make sense? If you're wholesaling, if you're getting involved in this, I'm just giving you a heads up because I know a few of you along the way will go to, you're going to be drawn to the light. <laughs> you know? It happens. Now, do you think Jason wants that liability? Do you think Jason wants to depend on Ali's ability to, to get a mortgage? No, right? So there's another thing that Jason can do, and that is called novation. See, novation is creating, so nova means new. So novation is creating a brand new contract where what we're going to do is substitute the party. See, Robert is now saying, Jason, you can get out of the way. I'll deal with Ali directly. So if Ali stops, does not pay, or if he does, does not move forward, is Jason liable? No. no, because it's a brand new contract between them. An assignment... You transfer liability, but not full. In a novation, you transfer full liability to the next person. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay. Questions? Anyone? No? All right, cool. So, in case of novation, the old contract no longer has any force. It's a brand new contract. We're going to go on the next page to where it says default or breach of contract. Default or breach of contract. A breach of contract, a breach is a violation, certain violation of any terms or conditions of a contract without legal excuse. Circle, underline, to stars, with arrows, bubbles, whatever you got to put. Without legal excuse. Meaning, I'm buying your house. But you know what? Today, I don't feel like it. So I'm going to back out. Is that a legal excuse? I don't feel like it? No. No. I have a headache. I don't want to buy. Is that a legal excuse? No. What would be a legal excuse? 
I don't have the money. I didn't qualify for the mortgage. The inspection failed according to, to what I wanted. Does that make sense? Yeah. Those are legal excuses because they're part of the contract. You got it? Yeah. So let's figure out the consequences if one of the parties backs out just because. It says right here, if the seller is the one defaulting, the buyer has three alternatives. Number one, the buyer may rescind or cancel the contract and recover the earnest money deposit. Number two, the buyer may file a court suit known as action for specific performance. That means to force the, the seller to perform the contract. That means to transfer. Hold on. It's a suit right here. Okay. And number three, the buyer may sue for more, for compensatory damages. So there's three things that can happen here. The buyer can say, hey, okay, no problem. I'm out. We cancel the contract, right? Give me the money back. Whatever I gave you as deposit, just give it back to me. Or sue the seller saying, hey, you're going to sell the house regardless. You cannot just back out. And that's called specific performance. Okay. Or number three, hey, if you don't sell the house to me, you got to compensate me for the time lost, for the money I took out already, for my 401k penalties and all that stuff. So these are the three options. Yes? I don't understand. Which part? All of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to buy your house. Mm -hmm. And you decide, so I give you a $1,000 deposit. Well, okay. not you. So you're the, the realtor. realtor. But it's yours. Mm -hmm. It's held in escrow. Somebody has it. It's not in my pocket anymore. And you decide to back out of the deal. You're not selling anymore. But you don't have a legal excuse. There's nothing that says, okay, it's because there's an issue with the title, therefore I need to correct it before I can sell. I'm sorry, as an example, right? Uh, there's an issue with the property, so I need to fix the property before I can sell. I'm sorry. Right? There's nothing like that. You just decided not to sell anymore. Okay. The buyer says, okay, number one, okay. Just give me my money back and I'll move on to the next property. That's one option. So give me the escrow money back. Okay. Number two, I say, no, no, no. You're not backing out of this. I'm going to sue you and force you to sell the property to me. That's number two. It's called specific performance. You got it? Yeah. Number three, the third option is, you're not going to sell the property to me? No problem. But I'm going to sue you for compensation Time lost, money lost, and all, all that stuff. So these are three options. Let me ask one thing. It's like, if, if I, it's like, I want to buy this house, and I put the thousand dollars down mm -hmm. in your company, how long do I have to take to borrow me the money? To give you the money back? You guys remember escrow? No, it's like, the deal is not done. And I was person wins the deal. We're making the deal. The money right away. This house is for sale, okay? I did a contract with, with you. I put a thousand dollars down. It's like she wins the deal. Okay, so there's multiple offers on the property, and you're mm -hmm. asking about your money. So, the, so this is we're in contract. We're moving forward. Okay, so you won the bid. You're moving forward. That's that's what this is. As far as what you're asking, all money's into and out of. Escrow account, how long do you have? What is it? Have an eight month right? Have an eight month right? So say, what is it? Five days. Five days? Ten days. Ten days. Ten days. So Saturdays and Sundays count? You guys are just numbers? Five business days. Five business days. Five business days. So you have to go with the money? To return monies or to give money. Every time money is transferred into or out of an escrow account, you have up to five business days. Okay, if you don't give the money. You can sue. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is different. You know, She's asking about putting an offer. It was not accepted. It's not accepted. I just want my money back. Yes, they have five okay. If the money was ever deposited. It is deposited. Okay, if you confirm that it's deposited, they got up to five business days to return. Any money into the escrow account or out of the escrow account, up to five business days. Because it's like two offers I did in two houses. Oh, my, one is I have to put up $2,000, another one I put $1,000. I text the guy and everything is going to be like December and November. The money is not there. I'm sorry? 
She's saying she has to wait months. No, I got it. I'm, I'm like, yeah. just doesn't make any sense. Okay. If the deal did not move forward. No, it's like I won't. So. I don't have no idea. Do you need a realtor to work with? Because I'm. Yes. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> So, if you guys remember, chapter two, we talked about commingling, trust account, escrow account. Mm -hmm. If it's more than five business days, that oh, broker, you have to give the money that broker, you. give me a second. If it's more than five business days in transfer, in or out, that broker is not commingling or mixing somebody else's money with their own money. They could lose their license. Mm -hmm. What you can do? Go to the office? Real estate commission. Huh? You have to file a complaint with the real estate commission if they don't return the money to you. What I would do first, what I would do first, send a letter in writing requesting. A text message already. Letter in writing, certified mail, requesting that they return the funds to you within five business days as mandated by real estate commission. If they don't act on that, after you send the first or second good faith attempt to resolve the matter, then you can go to the real estate commission, file a complaint, show, hey, I've done my part trying to be, you know, so courteous and, and act in good faith, but they haven't returned my money. Simple. The real estate commission will then tell you how to operate. You can at this point, if you want, you can at this point hire an attorney and sue for compensation with interest. You won't lose because it's money owed to you and it's the law. Okay. So they were going to have to pay for the attorney fees and everything. But don't quote me on this because I'm not an attorney. So you should consult with the attorney before you take this action. It's weird. I never asked anybody to pay. Never happened with you before? Yeah, it shouldn't have happened. It's five business days in or out of escrow account. Remember that. For state exam, if transaction does not go through five business days, you have to out of, involve me the money. Return the money. Yes. Okay? More than six months. Oh my gosh. Listen, you know what? Give me that money and I'll give it back to you in five months and twenty nine days. <laughs> Because you know what I'm doing with the money, right? Yeah. Interest. I'm investing. Yeah. What do you mean interest? She's not asking for interest. She just wants the money back. Right? Just no. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm just messing with you right now. No, I know. But it's funny. Is this is this a, a an actual realtor, like salesperson, like license? It's a company. A real agency? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, don't 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 tell me don't tell me anything. I don't want to know. Because then, I'm, then ethically, I'm going to have to report them. But uh, yeah. Yeah. my thing is, have, said, have you dealt said, with him before? I call him. It's like it's no, no. Have you done transactions with him before? No. Or is this the first time? It's the first time. And the last time. I did too. But it's the last time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving forward, <laughs> we'll talk about that right after. Wow. Now, this was a seller defaulting on an actual contract, meaning you're actually purchasing the house and backing out of the house, right? What if it's the buyer that says, you know what, I don't feel like buying anymore. Mm -hmm. The seller has the same three options as the buyer had in the previous situation, plus one, the very first one. It says the seller might declare the entire contract forfeited, and the right to forfeit may be provided for in the contract, and according to the, to the terms of the contract, the seller may, be entitled to retain what? Correct. So, Anna, were you the one that said, I know you wasn't, but it's just for the example. Were you the one that said, I don't want to buy anymore? No. Okay. But if you were the one that said that, then you move forward. Me as a seller, I'm entitled to say, you know what? Forget your $3,000. I know. Because you're the one that defaulted. Mm -hmm. And that's what it says. Where it says liquidated damages, I want you to write settlement. Because if I accept those three thousand dollars, Amanda, I cannot sue for more. Right. Settled. Liquidated damages means settled for that money. I'll take the escrow money. That's it. Okay. You guys got that? Yes. Okay. If I don't accept that money, then I can sue for compensation. Could be more. Could be less. It all depends on the judge. 
All right, next. Statue of limitations. Does anybody remember six years? We talked about six years at one point? Yes. Why six years? Because that's the statute of limitations on lawsuits. It says right here, the six year period applies to contracts, foreclosures, mortgages, and cases of fraud. So if we enter into a contract for the next six years, it is binding, meaning you might have closed, but if there's something you find out along the way about the property or my mishandling of the transaction, you can still sue me up to six years later. You got it? After six years, guys, you're free to create fraud again. No problem. So if there's like two were I'm just kidding, by the way. Don't don't commit fraud at all. If you sell someone the house and there's two more backups and they don't have that problem until a year later, they mm -hmm. can sue you for that. Depends. Okay. Was the inspection done for that? Say it wasn't. Say the say okay. the seller said no, I don't want the inspection. The buyer. The buyer does buyer inspections. Does inspections. Okay. Right. We'll say the buyer says no, I don't want to do the inspection. I don't think. If the buyer done. waived the inspections, hey, it's on you. I advise you. Okay. I would actually have you sign something that says wait. Usually attorneys do. Attorneys do sign something. Yeah. And so that's a part of our due diligence to make sure that we are telling them they need to get this done. Correct. Well. Okay. We're consultants. And have some that say they don't want to do it, have it in writing, because that's going to save you all these six years. The more you have in writing, the more information, the more you have in writing, the less liability you have. So yes, <laughs> Ms. Portes knows exactly how to do it. Yeah. Put it all on paper. Oh yeah, black and white always. That's okay, racist. Okay. What about color? Oh my no, God. Black and white. There's rainbow. And me, there's... paper and the ink. <laughs> <laughs> Not that kind of color. Gotcha. <laughs> all right. Uh, contracts are used in real estate business. So, in real estate business, we have listing agreements, real estate contracts, and lease, leases, right? Preparation of contracts, you guys already know this, because we spoke about this about two times already. This is the third time. It says that New Jersey allows brokers and their agents, so salespeople, to complete residential leases and standard approved contracts on one to four family residences, right? Can we prepare on five? No. no. How about commercial property? No. We don't prepare those. What we prepare is a letter of intent and then attorneys prepare it, right? Yes? Yes. Perfect. So one to four family, underline that. One to four family residences and vacant single lots. It says to avoid the use of an authorized practice of law, brokers or the salespersons may not circle, may not draft commercial leases, option agreements, or sales contracts on tracts of vacant land, commercial property, or industrial property. So think about it. Anything that's not common, that's not standard, you should not get involved. You got it? Because then it's practice of law. One to four family, they're standard contracts, the law, they drafted the standard. All you have to do is fill in the blanks. Simple. Okay, and then attorneys review if everything is okay, we move forward. Yes. If along the way you have a friend who offers you an industrial property for sale, mm -hmm. you sell it, is that probably for you? Mm -hmm. Could you remind that, please? <laughs> if along the way you see talking to a friend who has an industrial property for sale, I got a factory, I'm going to sell it to you. Okay. Okay. And you, and you, you as a salesperson, decide to sell. Are you in trouble? Okay. You're a salesperson, but you're a friend. No. No. I'm a salesperson. I have a friend of mine who has an industrial property for sale. He wants me to help him sell. If I sell, because you said one to four family dwellings, right? Oh, okay. You can help sell, you just cannot prepare the contract. Guys, we can sell any type of real estate. Our license is not a residential real estate license. Our license is not a commercial real estate license. State license. It's a real estate license, period. <laughs> so all real estate involved. The difference is in residential, we can prepare contracts because they're standard, fill in the blanks. In commercial or odd situations, it gets complicated. So now attorneys draft the contract. It's still your sale. That's why I wasn't understanding. I'm sorry. It's still your sale. It's still your commission. Say it again. You must have a lawyer. 
Yeah. When it goes to commercial, we cannot prepare contracts at all. Therefore, has to be an attorney preparing. Yes. You got it. Awesome. Can you leave? No. It's nine fifty-two. Yeah, he takes it to ten thirty. No. Or more. Okay. It's Friday. Okay. It's Friday. It's Friday. It's Friday. It's Friday. It's Friday. All right. All right. All right. Here's what I'm going to tell you guys. Actually, I'm going to ask a question real quick. Who's going to become a realtor? Forget weekends. Next. Right there. Attached. You want to make money? Guess when people are out there looking at homes? Nighttime and weekends. So sacrifice now. Thank you very much. Attached to a proposed contract. <laughs> There's a meme going around. Thank God it's Friday. Oh, damn. I'm a realtor. <laughs> That's the image on Facebook. <laughs> Somebody asked me the other day, can you stop touching your phone? I'm like, no, I'm putting properties. Yeah. Sorry. Because, you know, um, a realtor, you know, like, he appeared 10 p.m. in my house, just to my house. See? That doesn't matter. You authorize it. I'll show it at two o'clock in the morning if that's the time that you have available. Yeah. That's what I just said. You authorize it. Yes, I authorize. All right, because for me to show the apartment, I have to have your authorization. Doesn't matter what time it. Yeah. Yeah. You work during the day until like ten o'clock. You only have. You only come home around midnight. That's the time you have available. If I agree to it, if the buyer agrees to it, that's the time I'm showing. That's the time. Because it's the only time. Because you know, you're like, a, a, you know, you want to make money. You want that's somebody like that. That's right. right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, <laughs> so, attached to proposed contract of sale as a cover page must be a notice that is included as the first page of Figure 11. One. And it says, appropriately revise if the broker represents the buyer or is functioning as a dual agent or as a transaction broker. What I want you guys to remember is that we have the CIS, that's a disclosure form. And then we have this notice on each contract that enforces the CIS. So CIS was just, hey, I could represent you this way. This notice is, hey, I'm representing you this way. So one is I could, the other one I am. You got it? Now. Because the broker or agent has a monetary interest in the transaction, the buyer could void the contract if this fact is not disclosed. So if I represent both, but I'm not telling you, Mr. Buyer, I represent the seller, or Mr. Seller, I represent the buyer, either party could actually cancel the contract. Next, New Jersey also requires the following language appear in exactly this form at the top of the first page of a sales contract. So every contract must start with, next page, this is a legally binding contract and you will become final within three business days. Please highlight, underline, double, triple, underline, three business days. What happens during those three business days? We already spoke about this before. It's attorney review. During those three business days, or up to the third business day, an attorney will study the contract and then will, again, start counting the time from the moment both parties sign and issue a notice of disapproval within those three business days. If it's beyond the three business days and nobody said, hey, line 125 got to be changed. If nobody said that, by the way, I said 125 is random, okay? But if nobody said that, then it's binding as is. Deal with it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. The state also requires an equivalent notice on leases. We'll talk about it next chapter, uh, tomorrow, right? Yeah. Other required disclosures, such as off-site conditions, lead based paint, Megan's Law, are considered part of the contract. We dealt with this in Chapter 3 and Chapter 9. Federal requirements. The buyer of residential construct property constructed before 1978 must be offered in the sales contract, a 10-day opportunity to conduct a lead-based paint survey of the property with the right to void the contract if hazardous paint is found. This was yesterday. We talk about lead-based paint, right? And who's required to make sure that everybody's following this rule? We are. We are. Right-hand side on top. 
We already spoke about this as well earlier in this chapter. Contract forms, it's fill in the blanks. And that's a problem because we need to know what to fill in the blanks, right? For instance, if it says seller, what should you put there? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it becomes a problem, believe me. You guys will notice once you do one. What printed matter is not applicable to a particular sale? It can be ruled out by drawing lines through the unwanted words. It's one through four family residential properties, but are all properties the same? So there are some things that apply, some that don't. Okay? Next. What additional clauses or agreements, called riders, are to be added? For instance, if you're buying with a mortgage, what kind of mortgage is it? If it's an FHA, then you have to add an addendum that addresses FHA to the buyer and the seller. Does this make sense? So these are there's a standard contract, and then depending on how you're purchasing or what you're doing with it, you have addendums or additional documentation to be signed. If changes are made, the rule is that typing takes precedence over printed form and handwriting takes precedence over type changes. So we print, if we type over it, that takes over. If then we scratch everything off and we write, it takes over. Does that make sense? Cool. Listing agreements, that was the previous chapter. Just highlight like the first sentence. Common sense is not that common anymore. Highlight the first sentence. Buyer's brokerage agreement. We went over this. I like the first sentence. Mm -hmm. This was chapter three. We talked about transaction broker and dual agency agreements. I like that paragraph. Or put a box around it. Your highlight is going? The first one free, the second is 50 bucks. Sales contracts. Okay. I have more back there. Okay. You're talking about the, the yellow or the... No, the yellow. Okay. Yeah. Sales contract. I already told you right in the first page that a sales contract is an offer. So write offer in front of that. And that's what par that paragraph says, so just put a box around it. Good? I'm going fast because we covered all this stuff already through the chapter and previous chapters. Something like Gary over again. Exactly. Offer and acceptance. Do you guys remember what this is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? What is it? You offer and accept. <laughs> you offer and I accept. Great. <laughs> it's the terms. Yeah. Okay? It's the terms. The With all the requirements and all that stuff. And if the buyer agrees to all the terms, then we have acceptance, right? Now. What if they disagree and they make a change to it? It's a counter offer. She must read. Right here. Counter offer. Okay? Counter offer. Highlight this as it is, put stars, put arrows. And I want you to write somewhere there, I want you to write rejection. Every counter offer is a rejection of the offer. Every counter offer is a rejection of the offer. That's what you need to remember. If it says, John the buyer put an offer of $200,000, including the drapes, meaning I really like the house, I want to buy it, but I really love those drapes. I want them. $200,000. And the seller says, I accept the $200,000, but not the drapes. See, what happened right here was a counter. And because of the drapes, the offer was rejected. If the buyer now accepts it the way it is, we move forward. It's a contract. The buyer is now liable to that first offer because it was rejected. Any change to my offer is a rejection. I'm no longer liable. I can walk away. Does this make sense? Walk away, Kelly. Both parties. Okay. If I put an offer and you reject because you made that change, mm -hmm. we're not including the drapes, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. right? Then I can walk away because my offer is not valid anymore. Oh, yeah. If I decide to accept your offer, then we move forward. Yours is binding. Right. Mine is not. Right. 
right? If I counter yours, okay, since there's no drapes, it's ten thousand dollars less. I'm just saying something stupid because the question is as stupid as this. It's something simple, okay? And it will throw you off because it's something so simple. That's why I give you the most ridiculous example: drapes. Okay. If there's a counter, and then another counter, and another counter, while we're countering, it's a rejection of the previous offer. Right. So if I counter yours, seller, now you can walk away without any liability. Does that make sense? Yeah. So counter offer equals rejection. Make sure you remember that for the example. Yeah, the seller should say they can have the drink, but the extra money. Back. Could have said it, but it's still a rejection. Yeah. Yeah. The moment I change anything, that's what I'm trying to say, any change to, to your offer, it's a rejection. Because mm -hmm. if I said 200000 plus $200 for the drapes, it's still a rejection of your initial offer. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Next is earnest money. We're almost done. Mm -hmm. Earnest money. That's the good faith deposit. Mm -hmm. Right? The one that Anne is waiting for for six months. Mm -hmm. You got it? Good faith deposit. Is it required? Is the good faith deposit required? Sorry? Let's look at the name again. Good faith deposit. Good faith. If it's good faith, it's just you're showing good faith in purchasing this property and you're not putting offers on the billion properties. Because once you put money, earnest money, it's kind of like, hey, it's hurting my pocket too. I really want this. Does that make sense? Yep. That's all it is. So it just gives evidence <coughs> that the buyer's intention to carry out the terms of the contract. That's all. Because imagine, imagine you put a thousand dollars on ten properties, and then you back out of those ten properties. You're gonna lose ten thousand. So if the intention is to hurt you. After the attorney review, they usually say, "Hey, put another four thousand. So now you're hurting for five. Does that make sense? It's good faith. You really want to move forward. You asked me about the, the money, in or out. Again, five days, right there. Earnest money must be deposited with broker. Please correct this, it's five business days. Where it says five days, correct it to five business days. Earnest money. Next to it, to five business days. Next to five days, you're going to put five to the same, right? Oh, it's important. That's it. All right. At the bottom, you already know this. Any cash deposit of $10,000 or more must be reported to Uncle Sam. Okay? Next. You have a sample contract. That's an offer. It must be prepared. Yep. Tiny. The offer is tiny, isn't it? Go to page 154. And if you guys look to the right, it says summary. I promise we're really almost done. Right after the bullet points on page 154, right after the bullet points, I want you to write. A signature of a witness is not essential for a valid contract. Because what is essential for a valid contract? Two Competent parties. It's not two, it could be ten. Competent parties. Okay? It should have a witness, but it's not essential. Okay? On the right hand side it says contingencies. What is a contingency? Subject to change, subject to something. So there's common contingencies. If I say I'm buying this house subject to the mortgage approval, if I don't get approved, do I have to buy it? No. no. If I say I'm buying this house, and you guys can just highlight that. If I'm buying this house subject to inspection, if the inspection is not satisfactory, do I have to buy it? No. No. If I say I want to buy this house subject to my partner's approval, I go home, take the contract, partner, uh, no. Do I have to buy? No. no. You got it? These are, as long as it's in the contract, it's stated like that, it was approved like that, we can always back out.
Now, Jenny, you were talking about New York and Jersey. Remember that, yeah. that deal you were talking about? Somebody wants to sell in order to buy here? Look what it says right here. Where the purchaser has another home that must be sold first. The seller may insist on an escape clause. What does that mean? No. If the house doesn't sell, your house doesn't sell within a certain period of time, I, the seller from this house that you're trying to buy, can back out of the deal. Mm -hmm. See, I don't have to wait forever for you to sell your house in New York. Oh, yes, you can. What? what? <laughs> no, you can. Back out the deal. Yeah, I don't have to wait forever. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> she's not like Obama, the, 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 the other version. Yes, we can. I'm like, whoa, yeah. wait. <laughs> All right, sorry, I got confused for a second. So, if it did not state in the contract that I could back out, then I have to wait. So, you have to be very, very, very. Exactly. So that's why you guys should always go through a contract training. Mm -hmm. Not one, two, three, four, as many times as you can. Mm. Let me ask you something. Have you noticed that throughout the days the, the material is becoming clearer? Like stuff that we spoke about in the beginning, we're touching now, is like, oh, that's what it is. Okay. Right? The first time, you're like, oh, what am I doing here? The second time, you're probably still doing it, but it, it's better now, <laughs> right? It's different because now you're kind of understanding the material, right? Did you get it? Okay, sorry. I don't know what you're talking about. We, I said 10 a.m. Okay. Um, next page. <laughs> We're close to summary. Next page. It's gonna pay off. I promise. If you guys follow what you need to follow, it's going to pay off. Okay. Liquidated damages. You guys remember about three pages ago, not counting the contract, about three pages ago, we talked about if the um, seller defaults, I'm sorry, if the buyer defaults, the seller could retain the escrow money as liquidated damages, so settlement. Okay. So that's what it is. I can keep the earnest money or good faith deposit if you back out. Look okay. so what it says here. I like this. The seller who does not, who, who does choose to keep the deposit as liquidated damages, may not sue for any further damages. So where it says liquidated damages, you're going to write settlement. Period. You settled for that amount. Period. No, I'm sorry. Am I yelling? No, it's just... Plain language requirement. All it says, put a box around it. All it says is that all contracts, because in New Jersey, in New Jersey, you don't have to hire an attorney for a residential property. You don't have to. You choose to if you want. Because you don't have to, every single contract must be in plain, common, everyday language. English. Where you can re where you can review it. You can review it and make a decision based on your own educated opinion. You got it? You don't need an attorney to review and give their opinion. Option agreements at the bottom. In front of it, I want you to write, similar to a car lease. Similar to a car lease. What's up, I think it's a phone going off. Similar to a car lease, sir. Because you got the option. When you get into a car lease, they give you two options. One is, in the contract says, one is you want to return it at the end. The other one is for a dollar more, as an example. For a dollar more, would you like to keep the car at the end? These are your two options. So rent to own is a lease with option to buy. All I'm saying is, for now, I'm renting this house. In a year or two, I'm going to make an educated decision about the house itself, and I want to purchase it for the agreed-on price two years ago. Okay? So, yes, I want to buy. Or, no, I don't want to buy. If you don't want to buy because it's an option, you can just back out. 
The seller is happy because they collected monies throughout that period of time, mm -hmm. and they can put somebody else in your place mm -hmm. or sell at regular value. The buyer is happy because, hey, I'm glad because I didn't like this neighborhood anyway. You know, have you ever felt like that? Like get into a house, it was beautiful when you walked in, and then you're finally settled, you're laying in bed, and like, what's that crack up there? <laughs> has, has, has it ever happened to you? Mm -hmm. Right? Or the neighborhood, or the school system, or whatever it is. So the lease with option to buy gives you an opportunity to study what you're about to buy. Simple. <laughs> On the right hand side, you guys are too much. On the right hand side, it says land contracts. In front of it, I want you to write similar to car financing. Optional? No. No, similar to car financing, where it says land contracts on top. Similar to car financing. What happens with a car financing? Do you get the title to the car when you buy it? No, when you finish paying for it. When you finish paying it. So a land contract, you're financing the purchase, but you only get the deed at the end. Okay? So that's why it's similar to car financing. So it says right here in green. Although the buyer obtains possession, so you take over, just like with a car, you get to drive the car, but if you stop paying, what can happen? Repo, right? Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam doesn't come to repo. Unless it's that guy with Who's the other Sam? Who's the other one? Let's shut it off. Anyway, so although the buyer takes possession when the contract is signed both parties, uh, by both parties, the buyer has equitable title. Equitable means there's money involved, so you, you're entitled to something already. But the seller does not execute and deliver the deed to the buyer until the terms of the contract have been satisfied, just like a car financing. You got it? Yes? Yes. No? Maybe? So. Summary. Okay, if you've missed it, here you go again, right there. Good? Good. Questions? No questions? We're here until 10 a.m. Come on, questions. Enjoy your weekend. Hey guys, make sure there's no storms on Monday so we can keep moving.